Hello, I'd like to present today um, some information about disorders of bladder function and Ehlers-Danlos. I'm Professor Vic Kula, Professor of Urogynecology at Imperial College London, UK. Hypermobility, as you all know, it's uh, always been defined as an increase in the passive or active movement of the joint beyond the normal range and it's a common heritable disorder of connective tissue and it's been frequently overlooked and it's almost certainly identical to the Ehlers-Danlos syndrome hypermobility type. And one of the key issues I think with all of this is that it is a multi-system disorder and I'm sure you'll have heard all about uh, uh, the fatigue or uh, the pain syndromes, the gastrointestinal dysfunction, um, but specifically in relation to bladder, there are re issues relating to incontinence, bladder pain, and uh, pelvic organ prolapse, but I'm going to really focus on the bladder. So what sort of information is there about lower urine tract urinary problems with uh, people who've been diagnosed as having EDS? We know that um, in this study which looked at children and uh, these were diagnosed with the Byton and Bulbana scores that uh, girls had day and nighttime incontinence which was significantly higher than controls and, and it's almost you know three times higher during the day and seven times higher during the night and the rate of urine tract infections was almost double 24 percent as opposed to 11 percent Looking at adults, looking at 175 women with low urine tract dysfunction. So this, this is actually a, a group of women who had gone to a hospital because of their bladder problems. And they completed a self-reported questionnaire, which was designed by uh, Hakeem and Graham. And uh, this diagnosed 26% of the patients had hypermobile EDS which is a you know, very high proportion of these patients. And it was noticeable that, that these women had 50% uh, higher rates of detrusor activity. So they would need to rush to pass urine. They would uh, leak before getting to the toilet. They would pass urine more frequently. They might get up at night. So that was much, much more common. Whereas traditionally, we've always thought because of stretchy tissues, that people would be more likely to leak when they cough and sneeze, and that was actually not the case. Masrudis went looked at in a different way. She recruited women who were in a uh, hypermobility clinic and then compared them with 30 controls. And they used a questionnaire to ask whether they had bladder symptoms, and we can see just like the children, these, wi the, the, these women who were seen in a hypermobility clinic, 60% of them had urinary incontinence compared with the controls having only 30%. And also there was anal incontinence in 23% compared with 0% in the controls. So this showed that there were significant impairments of quality of life in not only the bladder and the bowel. And what about in the general population. And this is a, uh, uh, a, a patient's association in the United Kingdom, which uh, uh, is focused on hypermobility. And they uh, asked their members about urinary incontinence. Um, and in this study, there were 373 members of the society and 39% responded. And out of that group, 70% reported incontinence. The controls, it was 30%. And we again see this signal of fecal incontinence as well. So, you know, th there's a definite increase in urinary and bowel problems in patients with joint hypermobility. Um, and the, there was an association between increasing weight and the fecal incontinence. But some patients will also have POTS, so postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Do those women have 
urinary problems. Um, and this is the only study from 2016. And out of 22 women, 20 were found to have uh, detrusor activity on urodynamics. And 14, so around 66%, had coexisting uh, painful bladder syndrome. So even with POTS, we can see that there's something else going on in terms of their bladder. So their bladders are overactive and they're painful. So what about the association between lowering your tract dysfunction and EDS hypermobility type? It's certainly more common in women, four to one ratio. It divides into three groups. There's one group who um, void very infrequently. They only pass urine maybe two or three times a day. They'll pass often very large amounts. And certainly what we've been surprised at is that the bladders will empty completely. But the real worry is that a lot of these patients go on to develop retention. And uh, this in the past has been called Fowler syndrome. Um, it seems to relate to the pelvic floor and the urethra not relaxing during voiding. And certainly it's very difficult once somebody develops retention to correct it. There, there are some techniques. There's another group who have frequency, urgency. They're passing urine more than eight times a day. They may well be passing urine frequently at night and they also suffer from urgency incontinence. And then lastly, we have the painful bladder uh, group who uh, have severe frequency because their bladder gets very painful as it fills and therefore they have to void frequently. So what, what do we see in the bladders of patients with the urgency, the frequency? Um, to be honest, the whole group, um, and this is a cystoscopy where someone has, there's a telescope which has been put into, through the urethra looking at the bladder, and we can see uh, hemorrhages throughout the bladder itself. And uh, when we do biopsies, we'll often see that the mast cell count is high in the bladder biopsy itself. So the upper limit of normal is 28 and patients range from having 28 going all the way up to 100 uh, mast cells per square millimeter. I'm going to bring in a, a second area which is important which is about bacteria and um, back in 1982 um, there was a study looking at mice and found that if E. coli were left in their bladders for more than 10 days, that some of the mice, about a third, would suddenly develop uh, little biopods in the bladder wall. And this was important because someone had found a study where uh, young women who had repeated bladder infections were found to have, despite treatment, each time the same bacteria came back and the question was well that how can that be true if you've treated somebody with antibiotics it shouldn't be the same bacteria and these biopods showed that bacteria can start to live inside the bladder wall what's also important is when they're living there they are generally asleep they're not actually active and therefore they can easily um, evade antibiotics. Hannon looked at this in greater detail and you can see that here we've got the bladder wall and you can see the little biopod of bacteria and when you look under an electron microscope you can see all the bacteria living together and there'll be many different bacteria there. But bacteria also are supposed to live with us. We actually are supposed to be in balance with them and the bladder is not really sterile. It's supposed to be full of lactobacilli and what we then found was that in patients with uh, joint hypermobility they actually have um, various abnormal bacteria. So this bacteria called Aerococcus cristensii um, was much more common in patients with urinary incontinence. So showing that we start to see abnormal bacteria 
in the bladder wall leading to incontinence. But why doesn't that happen to everyone? I'm sure you've got friends who have had an infection, they get cystitis, uh, drink plenty of water and flush the, the bugs out. And what uh, this group found was that despite all the, uh, this is in, in uh, mice, that having the same bacteria, the actual immune response varied and changed what happened. If somebody had just enough of an immune response, they would clear the infection automatically. If they had a very weak immune response, the bacteria would remain in the urine, but the bladder wall would be normal. And if they had an aggressive immune response, the bacteria would enter the bladder wall and would then cause an inflammatory response, which just kept going and would probably irritate the bladder. So what is it about joint height mobility and the innate immune system and bladders in particular? Well, we think that one of the key aspects is to do with mast cells and histamine. Mast cells are found in the tissues, as you can see here. They release lots of chemicals. They have up to 30 different chemicals, but the most important one is histamine in that it can cause pain, it can cause swelling, it can cause inflammation, it can cause rashes. And this then leads to the bladder becoming more irritated. It causes the lining of the bladder to be shed and causes repeated infections. So it can cause all sorts of different issues. Another part of the immune system is something called the mannose binding lectins. And here we can see a, uh, a white blood cell and it has a little foot which is put out towards a, an E. coli. And the important thing is, if there's a protein on these white blood cells, which allow the uh, white blood cells to eat and grab the bacteria. And you can see here, um, and you can see these little strings as they're trying, as the white blood cell is trying to pick up the uh, bacteria. If you don't have it, you're not as good, the person is not as good at getting rid of bacterial infections. So what do we see in patients with joint hypermobility? We see higher rates of painful bladder syndrome, as we've mentioned, and 40% have a reduced diamine oxidase. They can't destroy histamine. So if, uh, for example, uh, like a wasp or bee sting, you get that red bump, uh, which is histamine, 40% uh, of patients with joint hypermobility cannot are very slow at destroying it. So they get a much bigger red uh, bump, which is more painful. Um, and 35% have a reduced amount of the mannose binding lectin. So they can't really, they're, they're not as good at clearing bacteria from the bladder. And they certainly have increased recurrent urine tract infections. And the innate immunity, has, there's this increased inflammation due to the mast cells. And we found that a group of women who don't have a deficiency of diamine oxidase, but in a, are in a gray zone between normality and being histamine intolerant, they actually have an excess of mast cells. So they overproduce histamine and they're, they've got a little bit of an impairment in their ability to destroy histamine. And this, I think, has also been supported by a study from Lyons from the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, where they looked at 25 families with hypermobile EDS and they were being ex examined for their symptoms of fatigue, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome and skin rashes. And they found the worse their symptoms, the more they had a raised serum tryptase and they had more copies of the alpha tryptase gene. So what does it mean practically for somebody with low urine tract symptoms? Well, we looked at 200 women with hypermobile EDS and we found, uh, and, and these were women all who had urine tract infections. When we s tested their urine for white blood cells, red cells, the sort of test which is done in the office, we found that only 10% were positive and yet 100% of them had an infection. In the general population, we would expect it to be 90% positive because it's a good screening test, but it's not a good screening test in somebody who's got hypermobility. 
The second thing was that 40% of the patients had multiple bacteria. So that sometimes the report will come back that it's mixed growth, it's contamination. Uh, well, we actually found it wasn't because we found consistently we grew multiple organisms. And 60% of patients had cutoffs below 100,000 culture forming units per mil. So the standard cutoff where somebody would say somebody had an infection, 60% of these women had it below that level. And they would have been told that they don't have an infection. So what about the treatment of bladder problems? It's a big subject. Um, it's always towards the dominant symptom. If the bladder is overactive, the person's passing urine frequently, they've got urgency, then physiotherapy would be first line. And a beta-3 adrenoceptor, the myrobegron, works very well. It doesn't interfere with bowel function and it doesn't interfere with blood pressure. Uh, in terms of stress incontinence, obviously physiotherapy first line, but potential surgery does work, but one has to be very careful about if there's any infection or inflammation in the bladder because that will only worsen with continent surgery. And then bladder pain responds well to various oral medications, either directed towards histamine with antihistamines, type one, type two, or with mast cell act, uh, stabilizers, such as ketotophen or apatidine, and also intravesical medications uh, work very well, uh, and they can be, they coat and calm down the bladder but infection must always be treated, otherwise they won't get better. So in conclusion, there are higher rates of overactive bladder in women with uh, joint hypermobility. The urine and bladder biopsies often show multiple organisms, and so we've got to be very careful about how we diagnose infection. It can be missed. And there are definite elements of inflammation which are caused either by reduced amine oxidase leading to le increased histamine, or having raised mast cells leading to more histamine and inflammation in the bladder, and also reduced mannose binding lectin, which can predispose uh, a patient to getting bladder infections. Thank you very much.